thank you very much. Yeah, that's a long title for a, a two hour workshop. I think we're gonna, we're gonna touch on a lot of things today. Um, I wanna welcome uh, Arena. Arena's gonna be helping me. Uh, she and our coworkers at, um, at Sonotype. Uh, and we'll just, we'll get right into it. Um, I think a lot, like a lot of folks in uh, technology, I ha uh, have lots of hobbies. I've been doing uh, this for over 25 years now. I um, have an arts background, but I've been lucky enough to uh, work for some great internet-based companies as, starting in the mid nineties. Um, so uh, just glad to be here. Uh, I love this conference because it's right down the road from me. I'm in Durham, North Carolina. Um, and typically it's in, in Raleigh. I, I miss the whole t-shirt drive thing. I, I, I wish I had paid more attention to the emails on that. But um, what I want to do is and to kind of do a quick review of, of why we're doing the workshop, what, um, what we're really trying to cover, and then, um, and then look at some of the, the types of vulnerabilities, some of the tools and open source tools that are used uh, to, to help protect uh, you from those and then look at some of the more uh, enterprise tools that we provide as well. We will take a break at uh, an hour. We may take breaks in, in between. Um, but uh, uh, one, of the, one of the things when we go through the workshop piece of it, uh, we're going to do it step by step, but um, uh, don't worry about keeping up. We'll, we'll record it and keep going. But um, why are we here? Why are we building software? And why, why are we at a DevOps uh, conference, right? Um, we used to have uh, a number of slides that Edward uh, Edwards Deming quoted around software supply chain, and kind of a month or two into the pandemic here, I started reading some of the other ones, and and one of these desired outcomes is right uh, create a consistency of purpose and dedication to the improvement of competitive position to keep the company alive and to provide jobs for their employees. Um, I don't know about you and and your companies or your work, um, uh, but me and my customers. We're really, really trying to keep the company alive and provide jobs for us. Uh, so when we start to look at the big picture here, right, it's about this, this notion of uh, providing competitive position, which provides value to our customers. That's the whole reason we're, do we're doing DevOps, right? And the consensus that we've gotten to is that faster is better, right? So how do we get faster? It's been the digital transformation. Nothing has changed that. Um, I've been on a couple of panels lately where uh, the conversation has been about speed and have been about digital transformation. And we've been sitting in this limbo for years uh, with DevOps and Agile, where people were kind of half on board, not half on board. And, and you start to look at, well, what, what's kind of kickstarted? And really, the pandemic has helped kickstart that, um, for better or for worse. Right? But you, it, it's one of those things where we're now really uh, starting to see the promise of what we've been working on on the digital transformation for years now. And uh, it, digital transformation for us is agile, DevOps, DevSecOps, CICD. Um, we know that speed is the most important thing. Doesn't matter what, what book you're reading. It's all about reducing lead time, delivering secure features faster and valuable to our customers. And when we look at that, the benefits um, are quantifiable, right? Uh, we do more frequent code uh, deployments. Um, we have a faster lead time, we have a faster time to recover from incidents, and we have lower change failure rates, right? Oh, this company, uh, this company releases, you know, weekly. Well, sometimes it, maybe it's weekly because <laughs> not such great software. Um, but that notion of let me, let me get fast, uh, let me deliver value, let me fail fast, right? So I can build the business up. Now, fast is good. So what can go wrong in this? And for me, uh, Getting seeing this quote around proxies, the whole notion of the process, um, really brought out in the last couple of years. I, I think sometimes we're we're caught up in uh, the process of DevOps, the the actions, the steps, the tools, uh, the procedures, and and still really not focusing on on what the most important thing is. And now we're forced to focus on the more, most important thing. I think that's really brought uh, some things into view around what we need to do to actually deliver value faster and deliver innovation faster to our customers, right? And that I'm gonna oversimplify is that improvement of the competitive position to keep the company alive and provide jobs for their employees. If, if you ask anybody what, what they do at, at um, a company, this, this should be the answer. I do it through selling software. Um, my engineers develop software that I can sell, right? That's how the business works. Um, so to, to put that in motion, 
uh, how are developers getting fat developers getting faster well they're using open source software right uh, and this is no secret to the folks on in this uh in this session uh, the the amount of open source that a typical application is using uh, surprises somebody it keeps going up it's 90 percent now right um, when you start to look at the application how do we get faster well we get faster using the package apps and we can just focus on uh, the code and the hard business of uh, developing innovation around our business right and it's not just one language that we're we're using anymore right um, we're using java for the traditional uh, pieces. We're using NPM. We're using NuGet. We're using Python for the data uh, piece of it. Infrastructure as code. Right now, we're using all these open source components to even drive the uh, the open source components that we're using to build our software. And it's just becoming more and more complex. Right when you're when you're in the trillions of downloads for these open source components, it becomes hard to to manage. And you know the typical uh, the typical company just in Java components is it's around 380,000 components uh, annually that are delivered. Now some of these metrics that you'll see, uh, Sonotype is the creators and the stewards of Maven Central. It's the largest open source repository. So we know a little bit about scale and we know a little bit about uh, the components that flow through there. And we, and we partner with the other uh, package um, uh, manager company. So we'll we'll take a look at some open source products and and vulnerabilities as we keep going through. A lot of what, what we're trying to, to get customers to do for us is how do, how do they manage their dependencies, really getting them to understand that a manual process um, or any process at all is better than nothing. Um, and a lot of, uh, a lot of companies are, are recognizing that they really don't have a process. And if that manual process exists, it's typically six to eight weeks to approve a component. I mentioned in North Carolina, there's a, my insurance company is here. Um, they were able to save three full-time employees, uh, retask them, they were called librarians, and uh, they automated that delivery of the, the open source uh, components through policy, right? So uh, having a way to manage these dependencies, and part of this workshop is we'll, we'll take a look at that um, because when we, when we think about this, it becomes so critical that we have some sort of visibility into the open source components that we're using. And we'll see a lot of different ways to uh, to get that visibility today and which ones are better than, than the others, but we don't want to be one of these statistics, right? We know that one in 10 open source components has a security vulnerability, right? We know people are, are, are having data breaches and it's not just data breaches, it's using our build CPUs to, to mine Bitcoin, right? Um, it, it's not, again, uh, the, the uh, cybercrime trade is bigger than the drug trade, right? A couple of years ago, we said we would be able to say it's going to be, but well, it is bigger, right? So, and significantly bigger. So there's a lot of money involved in this. And it becomes complex. I mentioned that $380,000, uh, 380,000 Java components downloaded. Well, when you do that one in 10, roughly, you end up with 30,000 um, uh, components with known vulnerabilities, right? How do you manage that? How do you even know what's, what's in that uh, world? And again, we'll take a, a look at a couple of these because the, the open source components that we're using are the foundations of our applications. Um, I love this. I, uh, we, we got this, um, saw this one a couple of weeks ago and then uh, just on a whim in the Slack channel, I was like, oh, I think I wanna do an entire presentation uh, just on these, um, uh, just on these comics. And uh, there were quite a, a, quite a few that, that fit the whole open sourced, uh, open source um, uh, realm. So, um, well, en enough of the overview, uh, and I see chat stuff going by. It's hard to, to see. All right, perfect. Um, now, uh, the workshop part, right? Uh, I have, we'll get the slides somehow and, and, and PowerPoint and, and maybe and or recording. So um, I, will, I will screw things up here uh, as we do it live, but I think it's important that we, that we actually go through the, the process. But um, what we're gonna really do is, I mean, if you're following along, we're really just gonna follow along on part one or two, and then maybe a little bit of part three. You need a GitHub account, you need Docker installed on your local machine. We're gonna use visual code. Uh, there's some assumptions made, like maybe you have Maven. If you have a Mac, it's probably a little bit, a little bit easier, um, but we'll step through this right now. Again, if you have questions, um, feel free to, to uh, put them in the, uh, the chat window. But what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the anatomy really of uh, an application with a with a vulnerability, and then we're going to look at some of the tools that are available to understand 
what open source components we're using, what are their vulnerabilities there, and really do they match up to what we just saw uh, run. And um, how we're gonna do that is the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna fork a GitHub project that we have over at the Sonotype Nexus community GitHub site. It's, it's the Struts2 RCE. We forked it from somebody else, but um, we're gonna fork that. And then we're gonna add some additional features to the repo when they're gonna clone the project into our workstation. We'll build and run the Docker image and then see the exploit in action. Um, so let's go ahead and do that, right? Um, if we take a look at uh, Sonotype Nexus community, if you if you just go to go, uh, github.com, Sonotype Nexus community, uh, you can then uh, find a repository and we'll do struts to RCE here. Uh, one of the things that uh, you may, may or may not know, um, I'm gonna add a new tab to the right here and I'm just gonna go into GitHub. Um, Sometimes if you want to, uh, or if you've, you're using multiple repositories, um, you can create organizations that are really just organizations to you, right? So I had, had created an organization um, for uh, my repo, right? So if I, I come into organizations and I wanna create a new organization, um, we'll use the free one, right? And we'll just call this 2020-ATO, um, dash struts two. And we'll put our email in here, mori at sonotype.com. And I want this to be part of my personal account. And then we just click next. And now I've got an organization, right? So we'll skip this. It's just gonna be me where we gotta answer some questions. I kinda wanna know it's an open source project. We're going to manage some code, maybe set up some CI CD. Uh, we already have an existing repository. It's this one, and we will submit. Right. So now I have no uh, repositories. So let's go back to our clone, uh, our fork. So we're going to fork struts2 uh, RCE. So I'm going to come over to the top right. I'm going to click fork. And you see I forked it already. And this is one of the reasons. Um, I needed to create another organization. Um, one, it lets me organize things, uh, great name. Uh, the second is I, I just can't fork the same project into uh, the same organization. So created my organization here. Uh, we'll fork it into, uh, into that and wait a couple of seconds and uh, we will get a new repository, source code repository. So what did we just download? Uh, what did we just fork? Well, we forked the struts to reference uh, uh, the reference uh, application uh, with the exploit uh, for a specific vulnerability, right? So um, this is, you know, a realistic scenario uh, uh, where the reference project, now the reference project is the thing that was deployed. Uh, you could actually download the, the full project itself and it had the vulnerability built in. So um, we'll use this, uh, we'll go on the command line, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, we'll clone it, we'll build it, uh, and this will be a little bit fun because we, we'll get to use some of the Docker, we'll use some Python, we'll, we'll look at um, actually how, how nasty some of these uh, vulnerabilities can be, and then we'll, then we'll go from there. So uh, before we do that, there are a couple of steps uh, that we need to do. We're going to enable the issues, we're going to enable dependency uh, graph because we want to see what GitHub actually says uh, about our projects um, from a security standpoint. Uh, I actually dropped the part where we need the issues, so we don't necessarily need to enable in the issues, but uh, we might as well. So we'll come over to our settings. Let me make sure I'm in the right one over here. We'll come into our settings. We'll scroll down. I always think I'm in the wrong place because this big template here, but if you scroll down, your new uh, projects don't get forked with the, the issue. So we'll just check the issue box. You don't have to save anything. You'll see the little check box there. Um, my dog just came back from his walk, the joys of working from home. Uh, so as we come through, we'll also uh, come to our insights here and we're gonna look at the dependency graphs and we'll enable the dependency graphs here, All right? Um, let's enable the, the dependabot too so we can see everything that's, that's happening in our world. Um, security, uh, so you can set up security policies. Uh, when you're, when you're looking at uh, security policies of, 
of repos. This really is the policy of the project. So a lot of the things that you'll see within GitHub aren't necessarily the same as is kind of the use of GitHub Enterprise, for example, where uh, almost all of the, the open source components are, are uh, project-based in GitHub, where you start thinking about, well, what is the security policy of this thing that I'm delivering to uh, customers? What security advisories am I publishing for my users of this, um, of this component? All right. So um, we've got our we've got our repo. We, we're going to clone the project to our workstation uh, now. So let's come back over here. And right away, when we when we did our depend upon and our uh, dependency graph, the GitHub found a couple of security vulnerabilities in our dependencies. Right. Uh, we can actually come back and see what they are. It's in log for J. Uh, we'll we'll take a break from this for a second, and but we'll we'll come back to it and see what that. What that really means, and what are they actually seeing there, so we can get a, a get a good sense of um, is that adequate or not, right? Uh, so let's go back to my code here. And uh, Arena, if you if I'm not paying attention and you're asking questions, feel free to text me, and my phone can ring. So uh, next thing is we're going to clone it, right? We're going to bring it down to our our workstation. We're we're going to build it with um, uh, with Docker Desktop. Uh, if you haven't already. Uh, take a look at the GitHub uh, CLI. Uh, it was easy to install. It was easy to get the um, get everything done. I, I have to <laughs> remember to not type git clone and then uh, paste this here. Um, but let's uh, let's jump right into uh, into it. So I end up creating a 2020 ATO directory, and you can see I've already uh, cloned or cloned uh, forked and cloned this before. Um, but I'm going to, um, we'll see, we'll actually make dir a uh, real one. So we'll speed in there. Now we'll, now we'll come back and, I don't know about you, but anytime I can copy and paste, I do because I fat finger things. So, Pretty awesome once you authenticate and, and put all your, your data in, it really is just GH repo clone blah. Now uh, I end up with uh, a struts two RCE. So I just created the real one because again, I had uh, two, um, two different repos at that point, right? Two different fork ones. And um, uh, there, there we go. So let me make this a little bit bigger. Uh, I'd be remiss if I uh, didn't mention fish here and Starship. Uh, if you're looking for uh, new shells on the on the Mac and others, um, it knows I'm in a Git repository and uh, it knows I've got Python and um, it knows that uh, um, what branch I'm on. Uh, Arena's uh, laughing because I've made everybody on our team try to switch at least. So uh, let's take a look. Pretty simple. Um, Pretty simple directory. I've got a, a source. There's a palm.xml file, so it is a uh, a Java application. And then there's a uh, an exploit.python. So when we actually build it, we're going to run this Python file, and it's going to do the heavy lifting of um, of the the exploit itself. And then um, yeah, we'll take a look at, at what it does. So let me um, go to our next slide here. So what we're going to do is we're going to clean and package. This is Maven uh, W. It's a, a bundled uh, Maven script. What the clean is going to do is clean the, the build directory and it's going to package it up. Now, when it packages it up, um, I actually am going to make one other change here. Um, this is a, a Maven project, right? Uh, Some type used to, used to um, be nicknamed the, uh, the Maven company or our co-founder was one of the key contributors early in the, the Maven project. Again, uh, Ma uh, stewards of, of Maven Central. So a lot of what I end up doing is um, is Maven in the background. So, but this is a, a Maven project. And so for more than 10 years, we've been trying to accelerate um, you know, project delivery and, and value to the customers through, uh, through project management here. But what I'm gonna do is I've got to come over here and you may not have to do this but some of, um, we will CD into the right place and we'll, the M2 directory in Maven is um, where your settings file uh, are. 
Uh, you can put settings in palm files and, and other places, but this is also where the, the uh, components are cached. And right now my settings file points to a repository manager on my machine that has one of our other products installed called a firewall, which automatically blocks uh, bad components based on policy. And I have that set. So that would not be a good thing to run to try to build this because we know this is a, a struts two. There's a, a, a known vulnerability with it. Um, my repository manager wouldn't even actually allow me to build that. Uh, so I'm just going to remove the settings.xml. And the settings.xml, if you don't have one in the Maven directory, um, it just defaults to Maven. Uh, so if you ever get your Maven messed up and you, you've been pointing to, to custom places and, and not really sure what's going on, you can just delete the, the settings.xml and have it, uh, have it go to the, um, the defaults. All right, so let me come back over here um, and then I'm just going to do uh, an MV, MVMW clean package. So it downloads all the Maven components it needs. It's going to download, download all the components and you can see it's downloaded from central. If I hadn't moved, removed that settings.xml, it would have tried to download those from, um, from somewhere else. Uh, tried to download them locally from my repository manager. All right, so we have a successful successful build. Uh, if I look at my directory now, I have a target directory. I'm going to CD into this target directory. And when I do that and we do another LS, right, it's built the war. It's built a uh, uh, sources file. So yeah, we haven't changed anything. The the uh, the project has built this uh, just on its own as it was released, and, and we're gonna again build the Docker and then 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 exploit it. So now we have that up and running, and we have our Docker file here. If we want, we can take a look at what it uh, what it does. Right? It's from Tomcat Seven. Um, it really is just gonna grab the um, uh, the web app and put it into uh, the web apps uh, directory. So here you can see it's grabbing the target and it's going to expose 8080, uh, pretty straightforward. Now I already have a uh, image called uh, hack me. So we're going to actually hear the steps here. Just so everybody uh, sees. There we go. So a um, couple of things. Let's look at what I actually have running already. Uh, I already have um, this running. So see, it's always complicated by trial runs. Arena, it's, it's good that if we don't ever do a trial run, then, then I don't have to back this stuff out. Um, and just Docker stop me, right? No, no, what I can do. We will uh, do this the fun way. If you haven't used um, Visual Studio Code, and if you're on this call, you probably have used it, right? So um, we can come over and actually use some of the plugins um, and extensions in, in VS Code. One of those is a Docker one. So in, in one view, you can see the images, the containers. Uh, I can start to see um, the uh, um, the volumes that I'm using, the networks that I'm uh, that I've created, right? So um, as we come through, now the reason I'm stopping this is um, I want it to port, right? Uh, I'd already started it. Uh, one of the things when we when we go through and, and build the uh, the the or run the image, I'm going to ask it to run on a port, and I kind of want that port so I don't have to change everything. So um, let's go ahead and. We'll build this. And I'm just going to change uh, this to ATO. And somebody remind me I've done that. So I've already downloaded it. So it's, it's reading some of the cache component, cache layers of my, uh, my image. And now I'm go just going to do a Docker run. There we go. And Ooh, gotta remember what I just named it, ATO. There we go. So we get back a uh, uh, an ID. If I now go to uh, 
see this refresh. There's my HackMe ATO. Um, know about you guys, but uh, love Docker changes some uh, things occasionally. Right. You could also view the view this through the dashboard here. And see that it's actually running. Uh, and while I do this, I'm going to blow this away. I probably shouldn't do this arena. But there's my hack me. And here in the background, what's really happened is we started up a, a Tomcat instance, uh, loaded the application. It's listening on port 8080 internally. And uh, now we're going to test it, see if we can actually uh, see anything here. So we should just be able to go to localhost 9080. So um, remember in Docker run, the first port that I specified is the port that I'm going to expose. That's what my local machine is going to see. The second port is the internal. What am I going to map that internally to? So now I should have my orders. That's fine. Uh, I really just wanted to see that was um, up and running. Now, uh, so I've got a, a Docker container that's up and running. It's got my application loaded. I built I built my application, and um, what we'll do uh, what we'll do next is we'll actually run the exploit. So we'll take a look at what the exploit looks like, um, and then see what the results of that. Uh, results of that exploit are. So as we come through, let's take a look at, uh, let's get my cell here. All right, so um, simple uh, Python script, not simple, but this is, it's gonna generate a pay payload and it's gonna pass that, pay pass that payload uh, I think this uh, is in the context um, of the, the post that it's going to do. And then uh, it's going to execute the, the command with that payload. And the, the parameters that I pass the payload are actually going to be executed on the, the host system, right? the exploited system. So let's take a look at that actually happening. And so I'm going to say Python exploit the, the URL that's exploitable and I'm passing the, the command PWD, right? So what returned was the present working directory of the process that is running the exploit in the background, right? So I can pretty much do anything also because this container is running as root. Right. So if I wanted to come in now and do ls dash l forward slash, if I wanted to remove minus rf star, right, I put that in there and forward slash, and we won't do that because we, we still want this. So we've got an exploitable uh, instance. Uh, it's a well known, um, uh, it's a well known vulnerability, but this is this is really how easy it is to to start to understand these exploits and and have a look and be able to test uh, in these environments. If you've done uh, any type of, of testing around open source vulnerabilities, you know that there are a lot of resources that, out there um, that allow you to, to understand them uh, better and, and actually run them and then in reality search for them as well, right? So, so good. Um, so now we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at, well, how, do, how would I have known that, um, that I was vulnerable? How could, how could I have tested this? We're going to take a look over the next hour and a half and, and look at some of the things like uh, shifting left. How can I, as a developer, understand earlier, am I using good components uh, in the process? All right. So we'll use the latest tools from a variety of sources. Um, and we'll see that the way that we're using them is a little bit late uh, in the pipeline uh, if we were just waiting to, well, we're actually going to scan the container that gets built. Uh, a lot of times security teams uh, don't have access to the source code or they don't want it to be in the build process, but they have this thing, this, this thing in application, and we'll just call it, a, a, you know, a Docker container that, that's going to run. Uh, and then they do the scans against those and use some of the tools that are built into the, um, the processes that allow them to have that visibility. Uh, spoiler alert, we know that the application is vulnerable because we just saw that it was uh, vulnerable, right? And, um, and you know it's great to say that yep we're vulnerable it's, it's horrible it's you know but this is only a workshop it doesn't really apply 
Well, I mentioned those resources that are out there that allow you to find um, resources like this, right? Uh, Google lets you find in URL or type action equals dot do, which is a common uh, file extension for, for struts. Um, great framework. Um, there are good versions of struts to be used and we'll see that a little bit later on. Um, but this isn't just a workshop, right? Uh, with the number of open source components that we're using, with the new vulnerabilities that exist, with the new types of attacks that are uh, that we're seeing in the field where uh, it's it's gone a little bit beyond typo squatting, right? Where we're starting to use the power of open source and the bad guys are using the power of open source uh, to inject vulnerabilities, right? We're not waiting for the typical uh, notification disclosure process of a known vulnerability. If I can get a vulnerability inserted into a JavaScript package that supports 50,000 other packages, you know, a slight, only a slight exaggeration, exaggeration on that. I think that the, the numbers are 50% um, uh, of the most influential people um, have an impact on 85% of the packages, um, just in terms of the, the dependencies. Um, if you've installed React, you know, the React installs over a thousand dependencies, right? So um, we need to have this under control. We have, need to have this visibility. Um, so what are some of the, the tools to, that we can use to evaluate evaluate risk? Well, whenever GitHub says something, uh, people listen. Um, do they listen 100% of the time? Uh, and completely, uh, no, but um, GitHub does a really great job. Microsoft does a really great job on, on really trying to understand what the developers want and, um, and understand you know, what, what they can provide at, um, at a, a free level to the, the, uh, their primary users, which are the, the projects themselves, uh, as well as the enterprise, right? So what does GitHub say? Well, we looked at it um, earlier. Let's go back to our repo. So we built this application uh, from our repo, our, um, our source code repo. Uh, and it did tell us that we have two uh, security vulnerabilities in our dependencies. So uh, we wanted to come over and, and look at what those are, right? Well, it, they mentioned that uh, there's some security vulnerabilities in Log4j core, and they'll give us this data. Um, this is uh, really just pulled straight from the, the NVD. Uh, they also give us a recommendation, right? They give us a recommendation that uh, they can use that at 2.13.2 uh, or later. Um, but this has nothing to do with the, the vulnerability that just allowed us to take control of that system, right? Um, so even, even visibility at the manifest level, right? This is, this is what we call manifest um, scanning is because GitHub doesn't really know what ended up on the other side. It knows that there's a Docker file there, right? It knows that there's a Jenkins file there. It knows that uh, there's a Palm file there and that Palm file is the manifest. So if I come back to my insights and I look at this dependency graph, What's going to happen is they're going to look at that palm file and tell me right, what components that I'm using and are there known vulnerabilities. Great place to start. Um, we have a product called Depth Shield uh, that's free for users that does the same thing. Um, but the reality is this, this is limiting a little bit because it doesn't know uh, things like uh, which version of struts that I'm using. Right? Um, it should know which version of, of struts that I'm using. Um, but it can't just because the way that, that the palm file is working, um, it's it's getting its version from uh, from somewhere else, and that's why you see some of these are blank and don't have a version number. So it really can't do an evaluation. But again, it's a great place to start. Um, I encourage you on all of your projects to enable the dependency graph, enable the the security settings, uh, so you can at least have some visibility. And we'll actually see uh, uh, a little bit later on if we have time that. What's in your um, manifest file isn't always what gets delivered. And one um, spoiler alert, it's this iText uh, uh, package here. Uh, in our palm file, we asked for 4.2.2. Uh, GitHub says that's what we have. Almost anybody that reads a manifest file will say that what we have, that's what we have. But what happens on the back end when we actually went and did that clean package earlier, it downloaded the newest version that has a new name and a new version number. Um, so we don't, from this perspective, really know what actually got into production. Uh, we don't know what version of really anything that, that got in production from this point of view. We're not even sure if, if we built it at this point, right? Does it really exist if it's not built? 
Um, but this this is this gives you some visibility into um, into that component manifest scanning. So a lot of the tools out of the box will look at manifest scanning. Um, again, they're great. It's a great way to start. The OWASP dependency check is one of them. Um, that data um, goes against our free data. We'll take a look at that a little bit as well. So that, that first way to, to understand am I uh, vulnerable again is the, um, the GitHub at the repository level. And it's missing a couple of the, well, it's missing some big things, right, on the vulnerability side, just because we don't know the version. So let's take a look at um, what, what has been more of a trend uh, lately is, well, if I know that this is going to become something later, why don't I just look at and scan the thing that it became later, right, the Docker container. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about um, the ability to, to scan the container as it goes into production or the container into production. And, um, you know, Irene and I spend every day all day really talking to people about, you know, that notion of shifting left, that notion of, well, if I'm scanning the container and I'm telling you there's a vulnerability in production in that container in the production, guess what? There's a vulnerability in production, right? So where can you start to look at some of this and, and move um, the, the, um, the fixing of the problem, the identification of the problem uh, further to the left? So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take um, the uh, container, we're going to scan it. We're going to scan it with Claire. Uh, then we're also going to look at some of the other tools that uh, that the cloud providers uh, are using to scan automatically when uh, you potentially put it into something like Amazon's ECR. Right, so let's take a look at this um, at Cl uh, Claire. Um, I won't do the full install here. Um, I am running it and I, I've made the configuration. Uh, but you're, what you're going to do is go to github.com Quay forward slash Quay, Quay forward slash Claire. And then um, we need to make a directory, uh, Claire underscore config. Then we're going to pull the sample config down and put it in our Claire config. Then we're going to edit the config.yaml. Um, and it's a different config.yaml. We want the this forward slash config, uh, well, not forward slash there, but uh, it'll be forward slash once it gets in the container. Um, we want to add a, a password just for um, the, the database, and then we're going to create a, uh, a network, and then we're going to run the database, and then we're going to run the Claire piece. Now, the other day, thing that Irene and I uh, do all day, every day, is um, kind of moan about right, how, how many people are having to actually update databases and keep their database up to date and run a database separate just for uh, the vulnerability. So we'll see some limitations here. Um, on that, but once we get everything running, we'll have a, a, a nice way to look at the, the config of, uh, of my uh, Claire instance. So I will remember which way I'm going here. Now, um, if I do a Docker PS here, we'll see that I've got my image there running and I'm gonna go up to my Claire instance and I probably shouldn't have killed it, right? So we might as well just redo it here. So what we're going to do is we're going to do our Docker run. We'll do our Docker run. Claire, there we go. So that's the, that's the server instance. Let me that was the clarinet, that's the server instance. I probably needed to run the... Run that one first, probably. The database one. Um, let's see what it does. Let's see if it complains at all. So we'll come back to our Docker desktop. Yep. And I'll load the configuration. We will come back. We'll just delete this. Fun stuff. Going through commands that you already have done. Oh, Docker run.
And we'll just double check. Here's our Claire config. Clear underscore config. And I told you I shouldn't have killed it. Let's see what. So we'll just, we know we've done it before. Uh, worst comes to worst, we'll show you what the picture looks like. All right, Claire config. Always one thing that goes not quite right, right? Come back. Definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over. Tomori, you have five minutes before the break. To the break. Oh, ooh, five minutes before the break. Okay. All right, well, let's take a look at, um, we may come back to, we'll come back to this um, and figure out what command I ran. Lost my mouse. All right, we'll come back to that and fix that during the break. Um, so what Claire's going to do for us is we'll take a look at the, the PowerPoint. It's going to give us um, a listing of all the vulnerabilities and do um, a Claire um, one command line, and then it's going to put it into a JSON file. So let's take a look at the one that I did earlier uh, just to prove that we've actually made it work uh, before here. So we'll go back into the one. Tell me I'm in the. So we'll look at the Claire scanner output. So um, we point the Claire scanner at we pointed the Claire scanner at the container, and we had it run against that uh, that instance, and then we got an output file that is going to list all of the CDEs. Now, the CDE is the, uh, the vulnerabilities and known vulnerabilities that exist in that container. So uh, it points it to the container, it breaks it open, and it looks at the, the installed components, and then it evaluates those against that database that we had installed um, just a second ago. So lots of vulnerabilities. Now, one of the things I wanted to point out is um, the vulnerabilities in, in Claire in this instance, they're looking at the OS level and not the application level. So a lot of these, almost well, all of these uh, revolve around the open source components inside that base image, right? Um, where I don't know how many I have here, over 100 vulnerabilities that, that don't relate to my application at all. Uh, but I really can't change this. I, I could change the base image. But this is what we see often in, um, in systems that are uh, looking at the container late in the process, right? They're breaking open the container. They either see an application layer only, or they see uh, the base layer and the OS la uh, layer only. Now, if I, as a developer, I had to go through all of these individual uh, vulnerabilities, I'm gonna have a hard time because it, it, I, I still don't know whether I'm vulnerable to that, that struts vulnerability that we know we're, we're vulnerable to. We don't actually, um, we don't actually have it in here at all. There's no reference to the application at all. And um, this is true also of um, the way that 
uh, a company like or a, a solution like Amazon, where um, when we upload our container into the repository and it does a scan, uh, it's going to be looking at that OS level as well. So I'm going to miss something, right? I'm missing that application that I built and, and put on there. Right? So if we wanted to take a look at what that what that looks like, right? We could um, come up here to, to ECR. So um, this is the hack me. This is my container. I had published it to uh, Amazon's ECR. Same thing. I've got a list and it's going to be pretty close to the list that, that Claire provided, uh, but it's all the OS level stuff. We know that there's Tomcat in here, right? It's at the OS level, but we know that there's struts components. We know all the Java dependencies that are in there, right? So we're missing the application layer. And that's a big part. It's a hundred percent, in our opinion, it's a hundred percent of the part. It's great that I can know the vulnerabilities, but I'm not going to go in and update the, the base layer uh, OS at, at all, right? But a lot of companies need to have a, a full bill of materials uh, for the risk. So when we come back, um, what we'll do is we'll take a look at, well, how can I see the application layer as well? What, what, um, what bill of materials, what does the developer use uh, so that they can uh, fix the application level problem, which is where the vulnerability exists early in that process, right? Well, we're on part two of it. Um, so uh, I, welcome back to the folks that, that stuck in there uh, at the end. Uh, we're gonna go back and redeem ourselves here real quick. Um, if you remember, I was trying to run uh, Claire um, a little troubleshooting 101. Uh, remember to read the error message. Um, I think the error message said it couldn't find the file. Uh, if you can't find the file, then you can't find the file. So I was actually in the wrong directory uh, when I ran it. So just to, to wrap up on what we did, uh, we had the Claire installed. And then um, I'm running a Claire scanner. And the IP is host. Uh, Docker internal um, because I'm running Docker and then the output and then I pass the uh, the name of the running image and then you get this nice big list of um, we'll put this um, out here clears and output oops let me do that I just did it. And then it'll start up the scanner. So you, you can see how companies can um, and folks can incorporate something simple like this scanner into their, their build processes or their release processes. Um, and then they'll get a, uh, a list of, again, all of the um, really the OS level components that were there. So uh, really easy to set up when you're in the right direction, when you're in the right directory. Uh, so um, yeah, so let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at what we were talking about and 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 look at the application from from an application view and because that's the open source components um, that have the the vulnerability that we're that we're looking at. So we're going to really try to focus this on uh, fixing the application earlier in the the software development lifecycle. Right? Um, if I can upgrade the component, I want to upgrade the component. I want the developer to be able to do that. I want the developer to be able to see. Um, the versions, uh, you know, the developer in the end is going to be the only one who knows, is this version, does it have the, the functionality that I have, does it pass my local unit tests, um, right, and then and then go ahead and upgrade that version. Uh, most of these vulnerabilities can be solved by upgrading. Um, if they can't, just knowing that it's there and being able to, to make sure that you've coded or remediated in a different way around that becomes important. So we're going to use, um, we're going to use uh, VS Code, so if you don't have it, go ahead and install it. Um, and if you would install the Nexus IQ extension for VS Code is the name of it in the, the marketplace. And then um, we'll go from there. I got a couple of overview, overview slides and then we'll, uh, we'll dive into seeing what that application looks like. So DevOps uh, conference, uh, we're gonna call it DevSecOps, right? We want to incorporate security early in the process. Uh, we wanna incorporate it everywhere in the life cycle in the pipeline. And we wanna do it at scale if we're working for a, a large company. And um, again, if we go back to the whole point of, of everything that we're doing, uh, it's to increase revenue and um, improve, uh, increase revenue through faster releases and better quality applications. So we can keep the company alive and we can all have jobs because right? that, that, in the end, that's what we're doing at some, at some level. 
And um, ideally, uh, we'd like to be able to do this if we're in an enterprise uh, across the entire enterprise and have a plan for uh, open source governance that includes security, legal, and architecture, right? Uh, we want to, to know the health of our components and really have policies in place that let me automatically get the best of the best open source components uh, and prevent me from getting the worst of the worst. And, and again, I want to do it in an automated way. And I, that what that really leads to is, is AppSec is spending less time on managing the components and doing uh, enforcement around something that they don't really do anything with, right? They just have some rules around it and some lists about what's in it. But the, the folks that are doing the development are the ones that, that are actually on the hook for that work that needs to be done. So uh, ideally, we'll, we'd enforce some policy. If we um, Later on, on, on the enterprise to pay version side of it, policy plays a huge role uh, in what we do and how we uh, look at that. And we'll see a little bit of it here in a second. So early shifting left, uh, um, it is the only way to do this uh, easily and uh, cheaply and quickly, right? And we wanna reduce the amount of time the developers are having to research and getting the approval uh, and downloading uh, the, the components themselves. When they find bad components or, or their vulnerabilities um, uh, that have been identified, we wanna reduce the amount of time it takes to remediate uh, and do the rework on that. Right? And we wanna improve the quality and we wanna improve it as quickly as we can. It, this is a software supply chain. We're, we're, we're trying to improve at every step of this. And um, if, you, if you're reading, I think probably everybody here has read uh, Gene Kim's books and, and Accelerate and um, uh, Mick Kirsten's project product. Uh, it's all about understanding the, the flow of the software supply chain, reducing lead time everywhere I can. Uh, and if I can uh, do this successfully, our companies, uh, our customers are just seeing the reduction and rework, you know, close to 40 to 50% uh, on the rework, just automating the procurement uh, process by 80%, right? Um, going from um, six to eight weeks again to, to minutes by automating. So um, what we've done is we've really uh, embraced this notion of, of developers need to be able to see uh, the vulnerabilities that exist within their environment. So if you go to uh, sonotype.com, forward slash product, products dash dev dash tools. Irene, if you throw that in the chat for me. Uh, we have a number of tools that are based on uh, the programming languages languages that fit into uh, the developer process, right? So uh, uh, AuditJS is an example of, um, of one that uses our open source or our OSS index product, which is also a free data product. So these tools combined can fit into the process, do an evaluation, identify vulnerabilities in the application, let the developer know early in the process and then be able to make those changes without automated PR requests, without all the automation that just generates work. Um, uh, my team's tired of me um, bad mouthing automated PRs, but I'm beginning to, I know now that they, they're they just generators of unplanned work. Uh, there's a manual process that happens, has to happen behind it. So we've got, um, we've got developer tools for uh, the OS level for Python, for Rust, for uh, you name it, we, we've got it, um, and, then, and then more, right? So uh, we're really invested in uh, the developer community. We want, we want the developers to be able to build uh, projects and open source components that we can then use as a company, uh, we can then use as uh, product developers because the better, the better the components that we're using, right? The open source components that we're using, the better our product is gonna be uh, that we deliver to our customers. So uh, take a look at that. We'll see a couple of these uh, used right now with uh, specifically the, the VS Code one. And then uh, we'll talk about OSS Index. Uh, OSS Index is our free data service. Uh, all the tools that you just saw there and then a whole nother set, uh, including OWASP dependency check and, uh, and other tools, use the data within, um, uh, within the OSS Index uh, to understand uh, what vulnerabilities and what components um, are good and, and how that's all integrated in. So we'll, we'll see those uh, together. Uh, again, the OSS index, um, I didn't write this, I'm not, so awesome uh, uh, Jeffrey Hesse, one of the brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, developers and advocates um, has built the majority of the, the tools that we have here. So they're free, they can be used anonymously. Um, and in general, just the the commitment that our company has to, to helping develop these tools, I, I think is a, makes it a great place to work. 
So um, let's get on with it. VS Code, we're going to install the, the extension. Um, and once we've done that, so you should be able to go to extensions, uh, search in the marketplace for uh, the Sun type extension, and then really shouldn't have to do anything else on the, the configuration. So um, I did come over and went to file open and I opened up my directory uh, where I checked out or cloned my repo. Remember I had 2020 ATO real one struts to RCE. And, uh, and now I've got my source code here. I can build my application. Uh, I could actually do all the Docker stuff from it. So all the stuff on the command line I can do through visual code. Um, I'm just an old guy and up on the, the command line quite a bit. Um, but this, this is about uh, what components am I, am I using, right? Uh, we mentioned the palm.xml file. Uh, if I didn't have a, a tool like we're about to see, I might have to go into the palm and read the dependencies uh, uh, here. Uh, there's our, our low G I text 4.2.2. Um, and uh, what we really want to do is give the, the developers this ability to say, okay, am I picking the right components? Do I have that, that visibility? So what um, the Sonotype plugin is doing, the extension, is it's looking at that palm file just like everybody else. We have a different uh, product that does it a little bit more intelligently. But it's, it's pointing out um, the components versions that I'm using and whether they're uh, passing or failing and, and the, the criticality of um, the policy violation. And it's a single policy with the free tools uh, that we provide. But what we're trying to do is give the developers the information that they need to, again, fix, find and fix the problem fast. Right? We should know straight ahead that struts 2 core 2.5.10 is bad. right? Um, and I can click on it here. Now, uh, uh, before I go any further, I, I want to pause and compare it to the, the list that we had here. The thing that we want to focus on is managing these dependencies and, and the versions. I don't want to manage vulnerabilities. Right? I don't want to manage lists, of, lists and lists of vulnerabilities because that, that's, not, that's not what me as a developer is thinking about. Right. A security person might be thinking about this, but if you give me a list of vulnerabilities and I've got to go through that list of vulnerabilities, I'm going to have a hard time uh, trying to understand what I need to prioritize. So giving me a list of the components that I'm using, getting that visibility uh, right here in, in the workspace, and then comparing that against a well-known data source of, um, of security and policy violations that really help me understand and, and focus my work. So um, when we click on uh, struts two core, um, I've got the package information, the description. Again, I can give you a list of all the vulnerabilities, but do we want to manage this right through vulnerabilities and, and looking at vulnerabilities, right? Um, or do we want to to find a version that that's going to be a, a good version? Um, all of our um, all of our tools actually have a, an upgrade path, uh, just like our OSS. Um, version of repository manager, they have an upgrade path into, uh, into our, our paid version that have premium data and, and better policy control. So that's what these policy and licensing uh, pieces uh, tabs here. So I can look at the, the vulnerabilities or I can start to go, okay, well, th this is the struts core 2.5, there are a number of vulnerabilities. Um, how can I see if, um, uh, if there's data around that, that that'll help me pick the right component, right? So again, we can see um, all the components that are being used, uh, direct dependencies, transitive dependencies. I'm gonna wanna focus on the direct dependencies, the things, that, uh, the things that I can control. But again, I'm bringing this visibility into, um, into the, the IDE. And remember, this is at the application level. You don't see any of the OSS level components because the container that I scanned earlier, which we see a lot of uh, security teams uh, scanning later in the process, isn't even created yet. Right, so I don't really care about the the um, the OSS level components. I care about the application level. And remember, the the two other scans that we did didn't show any of this data here, the application level uh, data, which is really where those vulnerabilities existed. Um, so uh, I've got the uh, the list of components, and how can I how can I extend that, and how does um, really the OSS index help me? Uh, find some find some good components. Well, we can go beyond this and, and actually integrate in with um, our products on the on the web as well. So 
Um, if we were to take a look at, uh, for example, we'll go to 2.5.10. We know that 2.5.10 is the one that we were using. Now, if I'm picking components here and I'm coming to um, Maven Central, for example, and I've got 2.5.0, we'll talk about with this little excla exclamation point here. Um, we have a component research plugin that we'll save that for a little bit later. But there's a view on OSS index tab. So we're integrated in with uh, OSS index at the, um, uh, at the Maven Central level. Right? So if I want to see a little bit more detail on 2.5.10 outside of that, um, I can see, oh, there are five critical and, and one severe, and I can remember to sign in, hopefully. Um, whoa. Stop. Cool. Maybe I won't sign in. I also got a new laptop last week and none of my passwords are saved and I can't type. All right, so there um, we can go back to, go back to my struct piece of it. And then the, from the uh, from Maven Central, I can view on uh, OSS index. The data is the same. Um, I just need to figure out what my username and password is. You can see I didn't go that far, uh, but this gives you all the data that you'll the that you'll need to to run that uh, to view the data. So um, let's take a let's go a step further here. Um, as we start to look at this, you know there are lots of different versions that um, that I can pick. If we go back and pick the latest version. Uh, and view here, right? I can actually get to a, a version that doesn't have any known vulnerabilities. Right? So uh, even without having to log in and provide, this is one of Jeffrey's like key things here is I shouldn't have to log in uh, to get that data, but we can go back and look at different versions um, and see which ones can I use. Now, um, this is important because, you know, sometimes you get to build an application straight from scratch and you're you're getting to pick the the right versions but i want to get to a version that i know is going to work uh, that has no known vulnerabilities so that i can upgrade that and then rerun my uh rerun my scan and that visibility into my app and it's probably going to take care of a number another number of uh vulnerabilities that exist right so um having this visibility into the components that I'm using, and then being able to understand which versions I can upgrade to and fixing them here so I could just update the palm file and go from there, right? Um, let's let's actually do that. So as we're coming in, we'll do that 2.5.10. Uh, we actually want to change this up here uh, to 22. And we'll re rerun this. Again, I have control over the, the direct dependencies that, I, that I'm using. And lo and behold, we get down to a full list of uh, the components, but now it's starting to look a little bit more like what, right? This was the, this was the view that GitHub gave us too, right? So GitHub couldn't tell us uh, what versions of struts were there. So it couldn't actually compare it against its data uh, just because the way the, the application was structured. But I make one change. I don't need an automatic pull request. I can make this change two characters. Uh, I can run my unit test. Then I can commit. Then I can have it merge. Somebody's going to have to do the merge eventually. So um, let me, you know, let me fix this as we come through and and upgrade. All right. Um, so whether you want to use uh, GitHub to get the version or start to look at uh, different versions on, um, on on Maven Central, right? You have this visibility. So um, again, this second part is going to be a little bit quicker than, than the first. So if, you, if you've got questions, just let me know. But um, again, you want to use um, tools that leverage the best data. And right now, OSS Index uh, and the open source tools that, uh, that run against it are providing the, the best set of data for uh, the components themselves. So if we take a look here real quick, remember which directory we're here. Let's go back to OSS Index. 
what are some of the other um, uh, other tools that are supported or the other ecosystems? Um, anything that you're probably using? Yes, people on this call will, will pick something that isn't in the list, but um, if it's not in this list, it's not real. Um, that's not true, but uh, you get it. Uh, and then what about the integrations, right? What are, what are some of the applications? So it's not just our uh, applications. You have dependency check and dependency track. Um, so uh, anybody who wants to build against uh, the OSS index can, um, you can use the APIs against it, right? So again, it's a free service that we provide that gives you visibility into uh, that application layer. Right? I wanna combine those. So um, let's take a look uh, real quick at our slides. We'll finish up. Um, and the, uh, the other piece of this, you know, we mentioned early, uh, the everywhere piece, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the tools that we're providing um, on, the, um, on the CICD side uh, for users in the cloud is on the Azure DevOps side, right? So if we can start to incorporate this in, uh, into the build process in ways that I can still see the application layer and not just uh, the finished uh, Docker container and the, and the OS level, I want to do that, right? I want to reduce the amount of time that, that AppSec and QA are reviewing the releases. Because if I just gave them the, the file from Claire, they're reviewing stuff that doesn't matter uh, on the application side. Somebody may care about the, uh, the Docker and we can have that discussion uh, later, but um, this focus on, on the container and the OS level uh, containers really on the wrong thing. Um, and we want to actually reduce the, the probability of a breach because we know where these open source components and the, uh, that we're using, which versions are we using, and are they vulnerable or not. So quickly, um, on the, uh, on the um, Azure DevOps side, right, I can incorporate my scans into the pipelines, into the, the releases, and get the visibility into the open source components that are there. Uh, which ones can be upgraded? Are there security issues? Are there licensing issues? Right? Um, what are those components? And drill down again, uh, focused on the uh, the application uh, layer itself. So um, again, again, another one of those tools that's that's leveraging um, uh, the data that we provide. Now um, we'll take this a step further, and, and we we looked at the the OS level uh, data, and we looked at um, the application level data, uh, and really, really encourage you, no matter what, what you're doing and what, what tools you're using, if you're using um, JavaScript or Python and, and the command tools, uh, you know, take a look at those free tools and incorporate them into your, uh, into your process. All right. So the, um, the next thing we'll look at is, well, as an enterprise, how can I extend this even further? How can I get even better visibility and speed this process up, right? So um, with the Nexus platform, we build on the tools that, that we provided for the community. Um, we have a uh, human curated data source. We're the first company to have a human curated data source. Um, the 90% you know, of the data that we have in, in our, our, our catalog is unique to uh, to us, again, we have unique visibilities into a lot of the frameworks themselves. So what does that really end up looking like for the, the enterprise? Um, and it's, uh, again, it follows the, what we've been doing on the open source side, but um, let's take a look at uh, an example here in, um, uh, in Eclipse, right? So from here, I'm actually using the Nexus platform, similar tools to the, the VS Code, but I'm evaluating this against a, a um, a custom set of policies, right? Um, I'm looking at the, these policies in relation to uh, the, the application and application categories, and we'll take a look at those here in a second. But what I'm going to do now is say, okay, from an enterprise point of view, what are some of the tools and the path that, that we can use and, and what the, what's the data source? So the first thing is all the colors you see here, uh, what does it really mean? Again, we're, we're based on policy. Let's take a look at that real quick. When I... Um, when I talk about policy, um, I want to have a set of policies that work for um, all of my applications, uh, all of my languages, um, all of the things that I care about, security, legal, uh, architecture, project hygiene. Uh, it isn't just about CVEs. 
It's also understanding that uh, applications have different requirements uh, for the licensing that they have, for the components, for the level of risk. Uh, for example, the, um, the copyleft licenses, you know, if it's not distributed, uh, the copyleft doesn't come into play. Uh, again, we'll see that with the, the PDF piece. So I can take a hierarchical view of my organization, my teams within my organization, the applications, and provide policy at each of the levels, but really inheriting the most um, critical pieces of the policy. And down here, I've, I've defined a number of uh, policies. That, these are actually out of the box policies. And uh, they cover security, legal, and architecture, and uh, malicious code. But if we take a look at the one of the policies here, uh, I start to look at, again, this happens to be a security policy. So we'll make it super simple. And we're looking at a security vulnerability greater than uh, 9.8. Uh, but I can actually assign separate threat level to the organization. So this is the, the importance of the work uh, that occurs uh, in the, the IDEs, right? So in the catalog and any, any reports that I have, I'm going to look at the, the biggest threat to my organization first, uh, sorted that way. And I'm going to look at it against all my applications and, and all the application categories. Um, as you might imagine, we've got a pretty robust set of uh, conditions. Again, not just about CVE, but it's about popularity. Uh, it's about the project hygiene rating. Right? We look at the 2020 state of the software supply chain. We, um, we evaluated hundreds and hundreds of, of projects on a, a core set of criteria that I'll show in a second um, that allows me to look at the project hygiene rating. Is this an exemplary project? Is it a laggard project? Um, the, the key here is to create this list of policy for open source components and managing the dependency that I have and not just managing a list of uh, vulnerabilities. And something unique to us that really makes this work in, in an enterprise across the, the life cycle is we've talked about early in the process, the build process, the staging and release process, well, I don't necessarily want to take the same action at each of those uh, each of those stages, right? Uh, the stages that I have here, proxy is my firewall. This is when when I connect the Nexus platform to my repository manager, whether it's Artifactory or, or Nexus repository manager. I can have every component that's downloaded evaluated against my policies and decide whether I want to warn on that or fail it or quarantine it. Right? So I'm actually shifting as far left as I can and blocking those components uh, from coming in. So that's why this first stage is fail. If I don't have it already, well, don't let me get it if, it if it's bad. Yes, I can wave. Yes, I can release it from quarantine. And then I switch back to warn here in the develop and the build stage because I don't want to stop productivity. Right? I want to be able to, to have the development teams know that there's a problem, be able to create a plan for remediating the problem, and continue to work on valuable uh, features right, for my customers without having everything come to a grinding halt. But if I start to get further down that release cycle and I'm in, in the release stage and I'm, I'm releasing something with a known vulnerability in it, I may want to stop that process automatically. Right? So um, automating that process, automating faster than evil so I can get these releases out uh, as quickly as possible so I can identify the vulnerabilities that exist. The other piece of that is not everybody is involved in every stage of uh, the life cycle, right? The people that run the repository manager are different than the, the people that potentially run in uh, production and do continuous monitoring on the ITSM side, right? Uh, maybe the system on build is in JIRA, stage and release is in service now. So you want to have the ability to, to integrate and notify different teams at different stages and you don't want to have multiple um, uh, you don't want to have multiple policies for each one of these. So single policy identifying what we consider to be a threat, and then applying that to um, to the policy. And then all the policy gets uh, used in uh, in the tools, right? So we'll see those in reports and, and the IDEs. Uh, that policy that we saw in VS Code, right? VS Code's talking to OSS Index and providing a, a default set of policies similar to this um, and ranking that policy uh, high, medium, or low and, and, and providing um, the developer the, the notion of what do I work on next? What's, what's the most important thing to, to work on? So let's see some of this policy in action real quick. Uh, we saw it briefly in the IDE itself, right? Um, so within the IDE, 
uh, I'm listing direct dependencies, transitive dependencies. Right now it's ordered by uh, risk uh, to the organization, the, the policies themselves. Uh, it's the same application, right? So it, there it is, struts 2.5.10. Now, uh, some of the benefits that you see here is I don't really have to actually go ahead and pick and find a version that's gonna work. I want something that's gonna tell me exactly which version I need to go to to match um, and meet my policy. You know, not security issues, but policy as a whole. I, I, don't want, I don't wanna have unpopular components. I don't wanna have old components. So look at the policy, look at security, license and quality, and then uh, be able to provide me with uh, the right version. I can then click on the version, um, uh, migrate to that. Again, same thing I did before, solve a ton of the problems with, with just really uh, a single upgrade. Yes, I've got all this detail around uh, the vulnerabilities exist and we'll see that uh, as well. But do I, need, do I need to dive into any of that if there is actually a version um, that I can use uh, itself here? Uh, one of the things, um, we'll go back to our, our log for j here. Um, the uh, both GitHub and OSS index and, and the Nexus platform say that uh, the version of, of log for j core that we're using is bad. We do recommend uh, another version. Uh, you'll see here in this version graph, I've got popularity across the top. So uh, the most popular is 2.11.12, um, but the one that's actually going to uh, pass with no policy violations is going to be 2.13.12. Um, we have a new uh, version of our product called uh, Transitive Solver that uh, looks at this component and its dependencies and finds the next version uh, or provides you the next version where the direct dependency and the, um, the transitive dependencies uh, are clean, right? Um, don't uh, fail any policies. The other piece of this is um, great, Maury. You can tell me 2.13.12, uh, but you know, what does that really mean for the developer? How much work is going to be involved? Uh, so we've incorporated a breaking changes where we're looking at the structure of the public APIs of the, these open source components and um, uh, looking at the number of changes between versions to really not tell you that it's going to break or not, but how significant are those changes? How, how close are they uh, to potentially breaking just in terms of, of the number? Um, as you imagine, the hundreds of thousands of components that we're looking at, we're really just looking at those signatures looking at the changes in those signatures, again, to give the development team the ability to, uh, to weigh the cost of that upgrade, right? If I look at 2.13.2, and um, right now there's you know, three or more um, uh, API changes in there, I'm gonna have to look at it a little bit longer than just say, hey, let me go to 2.13.2 uh, because I don't have any policy violations. I also wanna see what's, what's the work involved uh, in that. And you know, as you start to look at uh, different versions of the products, how do they change between that version and the next version, right? So breaking changes don't just happen across major, uh, uh, major version numbers, right? You want to know when those, when those changes are happening. So um, including that so that the developer here can make those decisions. Again, they're gonna be the most intimate with the, the product. They're right here uh, in the product that can actually uh, look at the code um, and follow the paths uh, through it. So all of, the, all of the data here is really pushing me towards solving the problem quickly uh, on the developer side. Again, don't worry about, yes, I can do automated pull requests. Yes, um, I can have um, uh, the systems recommend certain versions. Again, automated pull requests and, and those things aren't going to see, the, they're going to see the exact same thing that, um, that GitHub saw and, and actually aren't going to recommend upgrading the struts component, which is the, the most important um, component here. So um, just like we did before, we could say we could uh, upgrade this, uh, go to uh, another version um, and have it um, uh, have it show the, the updated uh, components. Right? Now, uh, before I do that, a uh, couple of other things in this list. The way, that, um, the way that you're looking at the components changes as well, right? So for a number of the uh, systems that we support, um, we do binary um, identification of the components. So it's not just the, uh, the, the palm file. Yes, we can see the palm file. Remember, here's my palm file. 
uh, here's my Loa G ITEX 4.2.2. Dependency management's harder than this, right? We know that um, I used Maven to download this. I used Maven to, to build this project. Um, as I start to look at it, right? Here's ITEX PDF 5.5.6. And if I were to look through this list, I wouldn't see ITEX 4.2.2 here, right? The reason that ITEX PDF is in this list uh, is because it's got a set of security vulnerabilities, but also a, a license vulnerability, right? It's a, it's a copy left, it's, it's distributed. Um, why don't I see 4.2.2? Well, the, the nature of these, the package management systems is if this company uh, wants to change its name and change its version number, it can. And this is what they want to do. They have new VP of sales and they want to make money. Uh, it's used, I, I see it almost at, at every customer uh, at some level. But when you're building the tool, uh, and as I built my tool, the as I built the, the application here, we can look at the, the output. And what, what's happening is, and we'll, we'll do it here in a second, um, I'm pulling these components from my open source repository, and it actually switches um, to use uh, the iText PDF instead of the, um, the Loa G 4.2. But the application um, knows this, right? The Nexus platform knows this, and it's going to provide me the information around the component that I'm using. So one of the, the things that we really, really care about is being able to fix this early and fix it with the components that we know are going to be put into the the application and later on in the process we'll see how we break those applications apart and view the contents of um, of those applications um, if i want to solve this problem even further left remember i i had to build the application first so i actually needed to uh, to remove my had to remove my settings uh, file so i'm actually going to copy over my settings so that this Nexus, um, um, settings, on XML, XML. All right. So um, as you're um, as you're doing this and building the applications, when I do that and I build against um, that settings.xml file, you'll see the results here, right? It actually downloaded or went to my repository manager, pulled down the components, but I actually couldn't finish building the, the component, the project, because I couldn't get the components I needed to finish the build. Which components could I get? Well, I couldn't get the log4j, which everybody said was bad, and I couldn't get for the struts. Uh, to core jar, um, which was bad. So we've quarantined those. And then there's this other rich faces core that's been quarantined. So this is a, this is an example where based on that policy that we had, right, in my um, in my Nexus platform, I quarantined those components and blocked those components from being downloaded, preventing the, the application from being being built. This is important when um, I've got you know, a thousand engineers or 500 engineers and, and I want to automate this process, right? I don't want every developer from their home office going to the public internet and downloading those. I, I want to be able to control that um, and give them the best components or block the best components. And you can see that, uh, see that actually happening here. A uh, little time check. So just a couple more minutes at, at the end, we looked at early, um, early in the, the IDE, the, um, if we come back to uh, looking at this org.apache.struts, uh, when we start to look at how can I find out which version I, I want to use, uh, we have a component research plugin that allows me to know where I'm looking at in any of the, uh, the product or the uh, dependency management systems and say, okay, I'm in Maven Central. I noticed that you're trying to look at actually 2.5.10, right? We'll go back to 2.5, well, any of these, 2.5.12, 2.5.10. You see the little exclamation point. I can then come over, um, I can view uh, the details, I can view the security, and I, I really don't care about the security pieces if I can click on the remediation tab and select a version. Again, not ever having to bring that bad component into my environment. All right. um, on, the, on the build system side, if we wanna take a look at um, 
the, the results of a, a build itself, right? So in my pipeline, being able to see uh, the results of those policy violations, being able to, to launch uh, a report similar to what the developer's seen in there and giving them all the detail. Um, I want to be able to, we'll come in and, and view this here. All of my applications here, we'll look at um, my application. Uh, here I actually have uh, that same list, that same bill of materials here. I can see what's direct and what's transitive. Uh, I can see the policy violation, right? Here's the iTex PDF that's sitting right there at the top. Um, but here's my struts two core. Um, here I get a little bit more information. Uh, what actually brought this component in? Um, are there any versions of this that don't break uh, my build? Uh, what policies are there? Can I can drill into uh, the vulnerabilities themselves? Right, and get the deep level uh, insight that our uh, data team provides. Right, the whole goal here is for to remove uh, false positives and false negatives. So, looking at the changes that are made, updating the the root cause. For example, if I do my scan and I don't see this component then uh, in this version range, then I'm not gonna um, uh, I'm not gonna flag that um, that vulnerability. Now, interesting here. This is the same list that we have over in our IDE, but we're going to take a look at something. We're going to look at um, the, uh, we'll take a look at the struts two core again, and we're going to look at the occurrences here. Now, the occurrences says it, it's a jar file located in the war file, right, in the lib directory, and this is where Java applications actually store their, their jar file. So this version of the report was generated by breaking open that war file during the build process, identifying all the binary uh, archives, taking a hash of that and identifying this, uh, this file as struts core 2.5.10. So in some of the other languages, we'll compare that with the, the manifest file and, and give a, a more robust uh, view and, and confirming yep, the same things in the manifest file that's in the, uh, the application itself. But the goal here is, again, this is what's actually in the application. This is the thing that's going to get added to my Docker container. And if I scan my Docker container, which I can, and break it open and find all the, the jar, I'm going to see the same jar, and I'm going to generate essentially the same report from the, the application at the container level. Right? Uh, the benefits to this are I could change the name of this file um, that gets deployed, but the Nexus platform is still going to say, oh, hey, by the way, we really think this is struts two core because the hash is exactly the same. Um, if hashes are similar, we'll actually identify that as well. So um, again, bringing this level of visibility everywhere in the software development lifecycle, right? So the developers have it in their IDEs. I can have this report straight from the, the build process, right, inside my Jenkins and have those reports associated with uh, the builds. And knowing the, the visibility that I have is about uh, the application that, that has been built, right? And giving me all the details I need to actually fix the problem. Uh, and then last three in the last three minutes, we talk about scale. Uh, if I'm if I'm doing this and I'm using components across uh, the same applications in my organization, I really probably want to be able to manage dependencies and manage uh, vulnerabilities and policy violations across my applications because I don't want to just handle each one of these as a one-off. So coming up to the dashboard, uh, I can look at well, what are the riskiest components in my organization, right? Struts 2.5.10, I have a lot of them. That means the risk goes up. But with a single click, I can find every place I found that, um, that version of struts, what application, what version of the build. So I can start to look at the risk to the organization. But more importantly, I can start to look at remediation paths that involve all of the applications, not just individual uh, applications and one-offs. And the, the last thing, um, as we start to look at digital transformation, we've been doing it for a while now, but executives um, are starting to look at digital transformation in terms of uh, compliance, uh, adoption, quality, and performance, right? How many of my teams are actually doing digital transformation? How many are actually adopting the best practice, right? So I want to be able to look at an application view and start to see our uh, teams looking at their bill of materials, their open source components, are they managing their dependencies? Are they looking at the same application in different stages of the life cycle? Because yes, open source components can be added 
to your application, right? I, I put my WAR file in my uh, Docker file. Well, what if I were to um, um, dump a, a new Relic agent in there as well? Don't I want to know the, uh, the contents of the new Relic package and the open source risk? Absolutely. So adoption is uh, all of my applications, all of the, the stages of my applications are really starting to see quality and performance get better. I should be able to get faster at resolving um, and remediating and my quality needs to be better, right? Am I reducing the mean time to resolution, mean time to repair? And then I'm looking at this again, uh, holistically across the environment. And the last thing I'll end with is uh, the continuous monitoring piece, right? If I look at my reports here, uh, I've got a bunch of reports that don't, um, that don't uh, build all the time, right? So if I've got applications that are in maintenance mode, for example, I still wanna have the ability to continuously monitor them. So a system like Nexus uh, platform can be set up to look at a specific stage and every scan that's ever been done, right? That latest scan can be evaluated against uh, the latest data every night without having to go through the build process, right? We have a bill of materials. We compare that bill of materials to the, the newest data. Um, that newest data, again, human curated. Um, and so every night, you know, you've got the most recent data and the most uh, up-to-date uh, vulnerability information and, and policy information against all of the applications. So uh, let me stop there. Um, it was great spending two hours with you. I'll give this back to uh, Katie. I know they're doing 15 minute breaks in between and uh, I really appreciate the time.